Hello, friends, and welcome to Conversations with Consequences. We are the radio show and podcast of the Catholic Association, where we aim to change the culture one conversation at a time. You can listen to Conversations with Consequences on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. We are also on Sirius XM Channel 130. Of course, our radio show is always a podcast. Go to thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts or directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, joined now by my co-hostess, Ashley McGuire from the Catholic Association. Welcome, Ashley. Hey, Gracie. We're going to welcome our guest now, and you used to work for, for his outfit, which is the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. You have wonderful memories from that great work, and his name is Mark Rienzi. Welcome to the show, Mark. Happy to be here. Mark, uh, the Beckett Fund has been racking up wins for as long as it's existed. Some of them extremely important wins that have shaped American society and American history. I'm thinking of the Little Sisters of the Poor, for instance, that we've talked a lot about on, on our show and that the Catholic Association has been very focused on over the years as it keeps rearing its head, right? We, we ne- they never seem to be finished with a poor, the Poor Little Sisters of the Poor. It's but true. It's almost, it's so cruel, <laughs> the persecution. So... The Beckett Fund has had another great win, this time in federal district court um, in California, and it's a federal court ruling regarding the case against uh, UCLA over anti-Semitic pro-Hamas protests on campus during the great unrest that we saw after October 7th that I'm sure is starting up all over again on campuses across the United States as as classes come back. Tell us about the case of Frankel versus Regents of the University of California, please. Yeah, it's really a, a terrible case and the kind of thing that never should have to be a lawsuit. But, you know, kind of this is where we are. So the case arose out of the encampments and the anti-Semitic behavior at UCLA uh, after October 7th and really culminating in the spring. And it's not a case just about somebody said something mean that I don't like. It's not a case trying to shut down anyone else's speech. But what happened on UCLA's campus was the university itself helped exclude Jews from the heart of their campus for more than a week. So the people who hate Israel and the pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian folks gathered at UCLA. They set up an encampment. UCLA provided them with the barricades that were used to keep other unwelcome people, namely Jews like my clients, out of the central quad on campus. UCLA instructed its security guards not to help the Jewish students access the central parts of campus, but instead to send them away. Um, Basically, the UCLA security guard said you can only get in if the group in the middle of the quad chanting death to Israel, death to Jews will say that you're acceptable. And they would actually issue wristbands to the acceptable people, but not to the Jews who have any beliefs about Israel. Um, And so this is a situation where a public university was not just allowing, but actively participating in the exclusion of Jews from the heart of their campus. That's outrageous at any time. It's outrageous at a public elite university in America in 2024. And last week, the judge issued a very strong ruling saying you can't. Mark, what effect does this have on any of the other colleges? I mean, for, you know, the last two months of uh, the last year of school, we were just inundated with images of these encampments on pretty much every major elite university and all saw similar stories of Jewish students being harassed, being spit at. And it seems like in all of these cases, there's a similar um, entanglement with with other schools. Is this is this particular the details of this lawsuit? They you know them providing the barricades, not providing the security to Jewish students. Is that unique to UCLA, or would you say it's just kind of a, a prototype case for what's been happening? at all of the universities, and are they in any way bound by this decision as well? Yeah, the judge actually ruled on pretty broad grounds. He basically said, look, if you're UCLA, you can't run a university, you can't run a quad, you can't run a dining hall, you can't run a library that Jews can't go to. And so he actually, in his ruling, didn't rest on the barricades or some actual overt things UCLA did so much as say, look, you're a public university. You can't have a part of the university that blacks can't get to. You can't have a part of the university Jews can't get to. You just can't have that. Um, and I do think it will have, uh, you know, I think it will have profound effects on other universities nationwide. They've now been told in crystal clear terms that you're violating civil rights laws when you allow this to happen to Jews on your campus. And what I think happened last spring is the university said, well, the only First Amendment rights I need to worry about 
are the rights of the people drawing the swastikas and saying death to Jews and death to Israel. And I don't think they gave any thought to the affirmative rights that the rest of their students have on campus. Well, now, since the federal judge has said it violates federal civil rights laws, I think they're all going to have to take that into account in their thinking. And I suspect they're going to be motivated to do a better job this fall. Mark, that's really good news. And congratulations again to the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty for winning such an important case. And and let's hope that it has a, a, a great effect all across the United States. But let me ask you, going back to the UCLA case in particular, how do you how do you suppose that the university got to this point? Because if they were actually asking students, well, what's your name? Oh, it's Rabinowitz. You know, are you, do you support the state of Israel so these people can uh, vet your entrance? That's, that's really uh, many, many, many steps down this, uh, this horrible road. What, given, if, if you took a charitable view of, of the university, what, what do you, how do you think they got there? Yeah, it's a great question because it's a place that I think a few years ago, most of us would have predicted or hoped we wouldn't get to. And you wouldn't see that at a, at a major university. I think they got there because they were too hesitant to enforce their own rules. And they were honestly too afraid of the angry students in the encampment. So they were doing things, you know, like a few weeks earlier, they had a pinata of Benjamin Netanyahu that they beat while screaming, beat that effing Jew, beat that effing Jew, beat that effing Jew. And the university's response was kind of timid, right? And in a way that it's hard to imagine them being timid about other slurs and other attacks on other groups of people. And so I think the universities in the spring acted out of fear of offending or bothering the angry people in the encampment. But what that meant was they were willing to sacrifice the rights of other people. And in this case, Jews on campus had their rights sacrificed while the university sat around and hoped it would get better. And they're legally not allowed to do that. I'm an alumna from uh, Columbia University, which I think is ground zero for the worst kind of uh, violence, uh, the worst kind of demonstrations, the worst kind of anti-Semitism. And when I was at Columbia, it was a very Jewish campus in many ways. I used to eat dinner and and lunch at the kosher cafeteria because my on the all-girl floor, we were either all nice Catholic girls or Orthodox Jewish girls. Those are the only girls on the all-girl floor in the freshman year. So I became very close to the, the Jewish community at Columbia. And I'm just, it, it, I'm so amazed at the kind, uh, how could anti-Semitism become so outrageously widespread? What, what do you think? Because even at Colum- you know, at Columbia, we saw even the administration making fun of, of the Jewish uh, students and representatives on text, right? They were outed making fun and they've lost their jobs and how do you, this is a big question, when did yeah. anti-Semitism become so socially acceptable? Yeah, I don't know. I think some of our Jewish friends would say it's always been so. Um, I, you know, some folks may be less uh, surprised than uh, than we are. Uh, but look, I, I don't know exactly when, except it's been clear it's a growing problem. Um, the, you know, the treatment of Israel and of religious Jews by the political left in this country lately has not been very charitable. And I think the more it festers and the more, you know, people in charge don't say something and don't do something and don't correct and they just go along with it, the worse it gets. And that's why, I, you know, we were so heartened by this ruling from a federal judge in California saying that this is outrageous. This is abhorrent in our constitutional system and we're not going to allow it. And so, my hope is that big court wins like that can turn the tide back the other way, make the universities behave differently, and that may lead to to, to better attitudes. But, you know, time will tell. Yeah, I was actually going to ask a similar question and, and read the opening of the very powerful opinion that the court um, issued. They said, in the year 2024, in the United States of America, in the state of California, in the city of Los Angeles, Jewish students were excluded from portions of the UCL camp, UCLA campus because they refused to denounce their faith. And then they said, this fact is so unimaginable and so abhorrent to our constitutional guarantee of religious freedom that it bears repeating. Jewish students were excluded from portions of the UCLA campus because they refused to denounce their faith. And I was struck when I read that um, by the fact that you know, the Beckett Fund, you know, I think, like, as Gracie was saying, it's so shocking to see this resurgence of of anti-Semitism. But the Beckett Fund has been working on countless other cases with a similar theme where um, student groups are excluded or banned or 
censored for similar reason that that they refuse to denounce their faith or central tenets of their faith. And, you know, would you say that this is a growing trend on college campuses? And, and you know, what are some of the other cases that the Becker Fund has right now that deal with a similar theme of uh, you can't be faithful to whatever your religion is and be a participant, a, an open participant in in the college what? Yeah, it, it's it's a great point, and I think it's it's a it's a it's a fair high level point that intolerance, unfortunately, has been on the upswing, right? And so, intolerance of people who are different and have different religious beliefs and try to live according to them is unfortunately in vogue right now. Um, and we certainly have dealt with it. We've dealt with it on college campuses. We've dealt with it in high schools. So we've dealt with it in public high schools that really go on the warpath against. Uh, Christian groups like the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, right? We had one case in California where the teachers, like the the, the supposed grown-ups in the room, would write out the beliefs of the Christian kids from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and say, this is BS, although they, they just went out right out and said it because they're cool. Um, this is BS, and that basically harassed them until they get off campus. And so uh, we have seen that in many places. It's terrible and it's bad. Um, and I think the antidote to it is two things. One, it's good people standing up and not being silent, right? And I think far too many good people were cowed by the mobs this spring on our college campuses and didn't feel comfortable speaking up and didn't speak up. And that's a problem. Good people must speak up. Uh, and then secondly, I think litigation has an important role. I think it is important to file lawsuits, to have judges say that was illegal, to hold the administrators themselves accountable for violating the constitutional rights of these people. I think until you do that, people will continue to misbehave. Mark, many people now in the United States are, are, are secular, and, and, and that trend is, is growing. I think people are becoming more and more secular. Our country is becoming more secular and losing sight of the importance of religion. Can you articulate for us, which I, I know you can, you do it very beautifully, why is religious liberty something that everybody everybody should care about for American society, whether they're religious or not? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. It's a timely question. Um, I think if you don't have religious liberty, if you don't acknowledge that there is a, a special core of people and their ability to seek God and seek the truth that the government should not interfere with, um, then you just don't have any real freedom, right? If the government can control that, they can control everything. Um, and it's important for everybody to learn to live with religious diversity, right? One of the things about America is we have this wild religious diversity. Some people don't believe anything about God and people believe all sorts of other things about God. Uh, and, you know, your neighbors can be anything. Um, it's actually really important and valuable for us to learn to, to acknowledge that and to then live together and get along in peace. And that was sort of the original American diversity thing to deal with, right, is a bunch of people with b religious beliefs over which they were killing each other in Europe coming together and starting a new country. And there were, of course, bumps in the road. And we we had horrible mistreatment of Native Americans and uh, Latter-day Saints and Jews and Catholics and all sorts of other groups along the way. But overall, respect for religious liberty has, I think, helped us learn to live together in peace with people who disagree with us about important things. And I think allowing people space for religion, allowing people space to disagree is deeply, deeply important to having a well-functioning free society. One other bit of it is that religion gives people some some guide, some some set of rules, some some rules to live by, some ways to think about things other than whatever the dominant social media narrative of the morning is. And I think that's one reason why religion is sometimes threatening to people, right? If they, if you want a country full of lemmings, you'd really like to stamp out all the religious people. Mark, bringing things back to the right here and the right now, do you think, I mean, schools are starting back up, you know, in a, some now, some in a few weeks. Do you think Jews can feel safe going back to campus? I know you don't have a crystal ball, but yeah. um, what, what do you think we're going to see in the next couple of weeks? Yeah, I'd say I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, the The return to school is precisely why we asked for the judge to give a ruling before August 15th so these students can go back to school and know that their university won't discriminate against them. Um, look, I've, I've heard from Jewish students all across the country at, at all sorts of institutions about how wretched their lives were last semester. And so I really hope and pray 
they get something different. It's really disgusting and outrageous that that people are going through that these days. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic that we're making things a little bit better and that the universities are learning their lesson. Uh, but we're going to have to, you know, people are going to have to get up in the morning and go to school and we're going to find out. Did UCLA uh, receive some sort of punishment or was just admonished to no longer behave like that in the future? Um, the case is not over. So all we were asking for is the order about what they do in the future. I'm sad to say UCLA appealed that ruling, right? So UCLA was told, don't discriminate against Jews. And UCLA's answer was, I appeal. And their further answer was that it would hamstring their ability to respond if they had to obey this injunction. Um, that's outrageous and bad. And so to me, that signals that UCLA doesn't quite get it yet that whatever they do to deal with their encampments, discriminating against Jews is not one of the lawful choices. Um, so um, eventually I do expect there will be punishment for UCLA. They violated clear constitutional law, uh, but that's not the stage of the case, case we're at just yet. Mark, we only have a minute, but I, I wonder if you could wrap us up by telling us about um, generally about the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty and where our listeners can go to learn more about your very important organization and the good that it does. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, so the Beckett Fund was founded 30 years ago. We're a nonprofit public interest law firm. And as the UCLA case will tell you, um, we represent people of all different religious faiths with their religious liberty cases. So we've got cases for Muslims and Native Americans and Catholics and Christians and so forth. We're named after a Catholic saint and we're founded on Catholic principles about religious liberty from Dignitatis Humanae. But we defend religious liberty for everybody. We've been very successful at that. We're 11 and 0 at the Supreme Court, and we win uh, the vast majority of our cases. Um, and if anyone's interested in finding out more or supporting our work, we're at BeckettLaw.org, B-E-C-K-E-T, only one T, Law.org. Um, and we'd love for more people to find out about our work and consider supporting it. Thank you, Mark. Always such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you both. It's really wonderful to hear about a win for religious liberty in the courts. And the reason for that is, as Mark Rienzi explained to us, that religion is a catalyst for all for good things in our society. I was thinking recently about how I became a grandmother five months ago. Our oldest son and his wife have a little baby girl who was born in April. I wrote a piece in Angelus recently about becoming an abuelita an abuelita is a grandmother, a little grandmother we say in Spanish. It's the term of endearment for abuela, which is grandmother. And I wrote this before I became a grandmother, but all of my hopes have come true. So I'm going to read it. And maybe some of you who are expecting to become grandparents or have already done so will, um, will participate in my, in my feelings about this great moment in a woman's life. Abuelita Lalita, my father's mother, would give my sister and I a great treat every summer when we visited Miami from Mexico. On Saturday mornings, when she was not working at the jean factory, she would take us downtown, a trip which consisted of two bus rides preceded and followed by long walks and waits in the melting heat. Our destination was the Sears department store, a veritable wonder house of goods in which a person could buy anything if they only had the money. Abuelita Lalita would make a modest purchase, something she had thought long and hard about, invariably accompanied by a carefully folded advertisement from the Nuevo Herald announcing a special low price that she pulled out of her purse. After that came our great moment, a hot dog and soda lunch at the counter of the adjacent five and ten. It was a treat that we found absolutely glorious. Abuelita Lalita has been on my mind a lot lately. My son's wife is expecting the very first child of the next generation of our family, a little girl who is making something new out of each of us, father, mother, uncle, abuelita. These are total transformations, like the ones that nature accomplishes every time a swimmy tadpole becomes a landlocked frog. It may be most remarkable in the case of the new mother and father, but my own becoming abuelita feels just as momentous to me. The child is granting me a whole new identity, in the proper sense of the word. I'm taking on a novel role, forming a new permanent bond, moving up a generation, acquiring even a fresh title. I'm receiving at her little hands a whole new set of duties and responsibilities. It has made me reconsider the whole concept of identity, something we hear about constantly, usually attached to broad categories like sex, race, or nationality. This entirely misses the real source of identity, which is relational 
and its nature which is distinct. Human beings are not simply interchangeable members of a particular affinity group, like checkers shifted around a board. We are unique persons who manifest our individuality more fully with each personal bond we make, whether chosen or unchosen. We are, each of us, the unrepeatable center of a vast web of human connections, and in each strand, properly acknowledged and lived, is the source not only of individuality, but also of real fulfillment and meaning. We know this instinctively. When asked who we are, we respond, I am so-and-so's wife, or that person's father, or my sister's sister. If we go to the deepest, most fundamental source of our identity, we can each answer, in truth, I am an irreplaceable child of God. As he exists in a relationship of three persons creating eternally together, and as we are made in his image, we flourish exactly in the measure in which we love and are loved. This is why the saddest person imaginable is one who loves no one and is unaware of the great love God has for him or her. That kind of loneliness is not compatible with life. The rugged individualist who will not be beholden to anyone, the cynic who considers all human dealings transactional, the armchair Darwinist who sees others chiefly as opponents in the struggle for existence, these are all the types who deny the relational essence of man. Perhaps at bottom is a rejection of the burdens that each human connection lays upon us. To love someone is to act on their claims on us, for companionship, tenderness, encouragement, correction, material assistance, the list goes on. And their claims cannot be set aside because they may be inconvenient or ill-timed, or even for requiring some great sacrifice from us. I can't tell for sure what claims upon her Abuelita Lalita was fulfilling when she took two little girls with her to Sears on those hot Saturday mornings. Maybe she was helping my mother a little by taking two of her children for a few hours. Perhaps she knew how hard it was for my sister and I to be all day cooped up in her little government apartment because it wasn't safe to play outside. I imagine she found our joy at the lunch counter with its red revolving stools infectious and that the joy sustained her on our weary return journey. What I do know for certain is that she was the irreplaceable and unforgettable center of a complex web of loving relationships, and that is exactly what I'm hoping to be, too, when I become an abuelita. I was, I, all these things have come true for me since I became an abuelita in April, and what's beautiful about it is that when a new person comes into the family, every, per, every other person in the family becomes something. There's, there's an addition to each one of us, to our identities. We become something new, and that comes from duties and responsibilities, and that those duties and responsibilities give our lives meaning. And it is meaning in our lives that makes lives bearable. Otherwise, things can get rather dark rather quickly. When you see people losing hope, when they go, when you see, when you hear about people or you know people who take their own lives, it's, it's a lack of meaning that leads to despair. Because when things are very, very, very sad and tragedies come to all of us, when we can transcend that sadness because, we, because there's a meaning to our lives and, a, and an overarching goal and a path that we are following, then I think in general, we are able to get through through those terrible times. Now, I've been thinking also about all this, watching, last night I was doom scrolling, um, looking at news about um, the, the Democratic National Convention, which is taking place in Chicago. And one of the things that has shocked me so deeply is the constant refrain at the convention, the celebration of abortion. It's coming from every every delegate. It comes from every every person who um, gets up on that stage. They celebrate abortion. Every abortion is the end of a life, but it's also the end of the duties and responsibilities that give our lives meaning because they make us. A, a little child is born, and she makes mothers and fathers with her presence. She makes abuelitas and abuelitos and aunts and uncles and cousins, and it is those relationships which give our life meaning. That is how most of us achieve meaning in our lives, through those loving relationships. 
outside the Democratic National Convention is a, a van, like a, like a taco truck, and they are offering free abortions and free vasectomies. What they're offering is no relationships. <laughs> they're offering pure individuality, pure loneliness, and it is truly a culture of death which is going on in Chicago right now. It's a celebration of a culture of death. It's really very sad. It's also sad that Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago gave the convocation that I don't quite understand how that can happen, how an, um, someone like that, like a cardinal, can, can walk by the Planned Parenthood van offering abortion and, and vasectomies and feel comfortable at a, at a giant celebration of abortion. I wish that wasn't happening. The pre representative from Hawaii, uh, when he was giving his, his, his vote you know, for, the, for, the, for the party's nominee, he said he was from the state of aloha, loving kindness. And he immediately then said, we were the first state to legalize abortion. There's nothing loving and kind about eliminating children and eliminating the duties and responsibilities and the beauties to our lives that come with those relationships. Whether we're the mother and the father or we, or that the way that that ripples outwards, all that love and meaning that comes from the web of relationships that children bring us. I'm praying for good things for our country, for good resolutions um, in all our states and then across across the country in our in our federal uh, choices in the voting booth that we're going to make soon. I hope that as a country we we choose for life and not for death. Welcome back to Conversations with Consequences. I'm your hostess, Dr. Gracie Christie, and joining us now is Father Dave Tomaziki, who serves as priest secretary to the Archbishop of Detroit, Archbishop Alan Vigneron, and he has just edited a collection of the writings on the devil by Archbishop Fulton Sheen that's being released through Emmaus Road Publishing, and that book is called On the Demonic. I think it's a very Im important topic. So many of us are feeling assailed, even if... even People who aren't religious or religiously inclined feel that there's a lot of malevolence in the world, and and it and it does. Our times are difficult and 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 heavy in many ways. Many people are feeling this. So, what a wonderful topic, and especially how wonderful that that you, Father Dave, welcome, have been moved to collect the Archbishop Fulton Sheen's writings on on such an important topic. Yeah, thank you very much, Gracie. Thank you for uh, having me on. And yeah, it was a ton of work. I, I, it took me three years just to put the book together, another year dealing with copyright, and then another six months with the publisher. So it was, it was four and a half years of really working on it. But then I actually kicked the idea around before. So you start counting things up and it's almost a decade long project, but it's all in Fulton Sheen's words. People keep asking like, hold on, isn't he dead? How do you write a new book? Yes, he is dead. But he intended to write a book on the demonic. In 1974, he said he was going to write one. I went through all his all his notes, all his uh, handwritten notes. I went through his books, his talks. I went through everything, collected what he says about the demonic, put it in the book form, but it's all in his words. I compiled it, but it's all in his words. And tell us why Archbishop Fulton Sheen is important in Catholicism. So he uh, he was born in 1895. He uh, always had just a, a tremendous gift for speaking for, for giving the word of God. And he's also extremely intelligent. He has two or three doctorates, depending on who you ask and how you count. So, so he, he, can, he can do the high level academia and, and break it down for the common man. He had his own TV show in the 1950s. He won an Emmy for that TV show. He, he was a, a rock star in the Catholic world in America, and he never lost his mind. He was very well grounded, very holy man. His cause is open right now. He's a venerable. His miracle has been approved to make him a blessing. So they're, they're moving in that direction. But a very holy man, very wise man, always had his, his finger on the pulse of society, could see what people are dealing with, could see what's coming down the tube. And 50 years ago, he was talking about the demonic, like, hey, we're entering into demonic times here. And, you know, you fast forward 50 years and, and, and he was he was as right as ever. So so what a what a uh, privilege it is to actually have his writings on this topic 
when he saw it coming through anyway. I've watched uh, at home, I've, you, if you go on YouTube, you can watch his his TV show. And I'm always struck by the idea that there was a time in America where someone of stature like that and intellectual and also stature in the church could have a TV show in America. And, and I'm sure many thousands tuned in and had real formation and, and real, real Christianity explained in ways that were not only understandable, but also funny, winsome. He makes you laugh. He, he raises the, the hair on your arms. He, he makes you weep sometimes. He had a, 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 this tremendous flair for the dramatic. He was very talented, just just in, in the natural talents. Then you put on top of that his holiness. His he, he prayed a holy hour every day throughout his priesthood. You know, he, he was a priest for sixty years by the time he died. So, so very talented, backed up by a, a amazing intellect, and all of that. More importantly, most importantly, is backed up uh, by being rooted in God, by being truly a human, a uh, holy person. And yeah, he was on TV back when there were like four channels. So I don't remember the exact numbers, but I, I think his weekly program got millions of views. At, at one point, they would get about ten thousand letters a. Day day really? inquiring about some things and whatnot yeah so so for example for example in the uh in the catholic world to publish a book if you can sell like ten thousand copies oh that's like a bestseller in the catholic world in 1949 fulton sheen's book peace of soul in the first seven months they had printed like seven printings a quarter million books no. and that's two years before his tv show that was before the height of his fame he was on the radio then he had some notoriety that was before the height of his fame 1951 he gets his own tv show he wins an emmy for it. he's on the air more or less for 16 years on and off um writes amazing books he, he was absolutely huge and i kind of compare him to a band like everyone has like a band that they love and all oh, that band i just can i never get tired of listening to that band well fulton sheen for me and for many others he just does it for me. He just got. He just has a way of taking me to Jesus Christ, which is really what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's and and again, he uh, he 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 deals with the the deepest concepts, the most complicated theology, but he delivers it in such a way that it's that it's understandable and it's palatable and it's attractive. And I think that that's a, a spectacular combination in, in evangelism and, and doing apostolate with, with the masses, especially as he did. Oh, definitely. And he, so in, uh, so he was a professor for 20 years at the CUA, the Catholic University of America. And about the time he got his TV show, he's like, well, I, I can't do both. I just can't do both. And he actually liked academia. His, his own preference was to stay in academia but he felt the Lord calling him to, you know, the TV show and the more popular books and whatnot. So, yeah, he, he has the mind for academia and the ability to break it down. And most people can't do that. Most, most academics can't break it down the way Fulton cheated. He, Fulton cheated. He, he was very, very talented. So let's go to the demonic. What does what does Archbishop Fulton Sheen tell us about the demonic? I know that's a huge question <laughs> that you've spent 10 years on, uh, but maybe you can give us a... Uh, the glimmers of it. Yeah. So in the 1950s, he started saying like, boy, I think the Antichrist is kind of on the horizon. Like there's something going on. By the 60s, he was saying it even even uh, stronger. And then by the early 70s, he was saying, you know what? I think we're in a demonic era here. And by 1976, he was just saying, yeah, no question about it. We are in a demonic era. But he, he says, uh, so, so, so God unites, the devil divides. Mm-hmm. He, the devil breaks apart. So death, division, decay, damnation, all, all those D words, that's the demonic. And diabolic, it even comes from two Greek words meaning to rend us under, to break apart. So God unites and the devil divides. And then theologically, he talks about the devil is anti-cross because we're united to Jesus, to God, through the cross. So, so to break it down as, as much as we can, God unites, the devil divides, and the devil is anti-cross. Hmm. And how did he see that, that division taking root in the 50s and then growing so powerfully into the 70s? What, what, was, what was the devil dividing exactly? Yeah, so the, the, the breakup of marriages, you mm-hmm. know, um, the, the, the breakup in the church, um, and, 
And he was, yeah, Vatican II was a good thing inspired by the Holy Spirit. But he says, when the Holy Spirit acts, the devil counters. So you see the silly season, as George Weigel calls it, yes. after Vatican II and bishops splitting, bishops splitting with the Pope. It was interesting. So, so when it came to Humanae Vitae, most bishops went against the Pope. The Pope actually went with the minority report. And who was in that minority report? John Paul II and Fulton Sheen. They, they stayed strong. So, so in the weeks after Humanae Vitae came out, as bishops are dissenting, Fulton Sheen is defending the Holy Father at, at, at a cost, you know. So uh, a lot of division there. He talks about the signs of the demonic. The first is love of nudity. And it, it's, not, it's not the good, you know, the body's good. That's not what it is. It's a twist. It's a perversion. It's the separation of the clothes from the person. And then as you do that, you take away the mystery. You take away the deeper part of the person. So, again, that's division. The second sign is violence, you know, which, which is always a, a, you know, violence splitting apart. The third sign is a schizophrenic mentality. He called it different things at different places, but it's the loss of identity. And when we lose our identity as God's children, we go off in all directions searching for something. But again, we're scattered. We're divided. So he just saw that more and more, the sexual revolution in the 70s and, and the 60s and whatnot. And uh, yeah, the devil was, was getting a, a big foothold. Let's talk about identity, because that's the big buzzword of, of today, right? Everyone's expressing their identity, and there are as many identities as there are people on the planet, I think, as it's working out to, to that way, right? If, if we follow that, the logical conclusion of that kind of self-actualization. What do you think uh, uh, the Archbishop would say about this, this moment we're living in now, this identitarian moment? Yeah. Oh, it's an obvious sign of the demonic. So, so there's, so, so the demonic always twists, you know, like he tells lies, but they're more often half lies. So yes, there is a uniqueness about every single person, no doubt about it. Like only you can love God the way you can love God and only God loves you the way God loves you. So like, yes, there's a uniqueness and a, a distinguishing characteristic about every single person, but in the end, we're made in the image and likeness of God. So when we split from that, then we lose our real identity and we go off in all directions. But uh, yeah, I tell you what, and, and I get a lot of hate mail for this, but it's just true. When you start looking at the whole LGBT plus 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 agenda, like, okay, love of nudity, uh -huh, big time, eroticism, perversion, yes, violence, so the surgeries and everything else, big time, schizophrenic mentality, you know, there were two genders, then there were, you know, 20 genders, now 150 genders. It just has the demonic in spades. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, it's very, very dangerous. The devil is really having his way with God's children. And, and in the end, like, that's our identity as God's children. And the only way to get back is to go to our Lord. And I think Fulton Sheen writes very beautifully about that. As Catholics, as Christians, we we have our idea of the demonic of the devil is a personal one, right? It's it's in it's invested in the person of the devil. Um, how did mm -hmm. how did Fulton Sheen um, address that? Because now I I bring it up because in, in the modern culture there's this idea. Well, there's you know there's a tendency towards bad things, but it's not a personal attack. There's not there's not a personal force that's that's attacking you and trying to to pervert you into acting bad ways. Like that seems like a spiritual bridge too far. What was his yeah, concept and, and, of that? And Fulton Sheen actually talks about that, that very point that you're making, because, yeah, when we domesticate the devil, make him something funny. Oh, he's got these red tights. Like, you can't believe in that, can you? And, and you kind of laugh. And, oh, no, of course not. And then the devil is strongest when he's denied. So that that in itself is a trick of the devil. Mm. But yes, I mean we, we read about him in Scripture. Our, you know, our Lord saw him saw him fall from heaven. We see in the Book of Revelation. We see in the Garden of Eden. He, he's there and he's personal and he's real. And he rebelled against God. And you know Saint Michael cast him out of out of heaven. And actually in, in the book there's a chapter on violence. And about a third of that chapter talks about that fight in heaven, that violent struggle in heaven. And that's actually made up of handwritten notes they found in his archives. It's a very, very beautiful section. But to answer your question, like yes, the devil is real. He is personal. And uh, when we impersonalize him, when we act like he doesn't exist or we don't really believe that it's going on, that's actually a win in his favor. So yes, he's real, but Jesus is 
is more real, and that's where our eyes need to be. Well, that's a very that's a very powerful point that you make. That it's act, it's a win for the devil, right? When we that's exactly what he wants mm -hmm. us to do is to impersonalize it and make it. Well, you know what we make it nowadays, and I wonder if uh, the archbishop got into this. We use a therapeutic mentality. When we talk about, we don't talk about good and evil very often anymore. In the modern world, we talk about um, dysfunction, uh, disorder, or just things that are that cause negative, um, negative feelings and things like that. But we don't really talk very much about evil or just sin, right? The word sin has dropped out of has dropped out of common common usage. Did he talk about that kind of oh, yeah. uh, therapeutic? Therapeutization Definitely. of the way we think. So, so going back to 1949, uh, the book that I, I mentioned before, Peace of Soul. So, so he was even writing that because you know people people were talking about oh, peace of mind, psychology will get you peace of mind, and it will if you have peace of soul. There's something deeper going on, so we have to get to the root. So he's got a chapter. He gives three weapons against the demonic, and one of them is the blood of Christ. And he talks about how when we deny guilt. You know, it'll just come out somewhere else. So, you know, he tells a story about someone who's guilty, he had stolen some money, and he starts having these abnormal manifestations of guilt. And you think, oh, he needs a psychologist. And yeah, there's something psychologically going on, yes, but it stems from the guilt from his sin. And he, he talks about how, you know, so many people would be better off going to confessional, laying their souls bare, letting Jesus forgive them of their sins and heal them. And then they wouldn't need the psychoanalytical couch. And not, not that you never need that, not that there's no place from that, but there has to be a foundation for it. And the foundation is peace of soul, our, our souls with the Lord in right order. So, yeah, he talks quite a bit about that in the book. And what about in your book and uh, on the demonic? Does he do you address? Does he address in any of of, of these writings that kind of therapeutization of of good and e wrong, good and and evil? Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, particularly in the chapter on the blood, and then even at the very beginning of the book, he he talks about. Uh, uh, about how, like, when we when we drop something, the world picks it up. You know, we drop sin, and then the psychologist picked it up. Oh, that's so, very uh, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it's it, it, uh, it's throughout the book. So, Father Dave, we're almost out of time. What who's who's this book intended for? Oh, that's always a tough question. I've been asked that a few times. It's always a tough question. Catholics, honestly, anyone. So. So, so I'm sure some people will buy the book for the wrong reasons, like, oh, the, deve the devil, oh, that's kind of cool. So that'd be like a wrong reason to buy it. But Fulton Sheen, he has a great way. He's got a great balance. His eyes are really on Jesus. So, so even if people buy it for the wrong reason, I think it'll do them a lot of good. So I guess I would just say anyone. I mean, Catholics would really love it. Fulton Sheen fans would really love it. But just anyone, and I think it gives a lot of answers to what's going on, a lot of insight, so we can we can see what's going on around us. But it's not just about, oh, what's going on around us, let's point fingers at them. It's about us. You know, how are we doing? Like the devil, as you were saying earlier, is he's a personal devil. Like he's really out to get each and every one of us. There's oppression and whatnot that we can look out for. And I think Fulton Sheen really covers it well in this book. So it, it, it's meant for everyone. I think I think anyone high school or older would, would really benefit from this book. Well, thank you so much, Father Dave Tomaziki. And uh, thank you for compiling what I'm sure is a very important collection of writings and thoughts from Archbishop Fulton Sheen on the demonic. That's the name of your book. And our readers can uh, learn more about it at stpaulcenter.com forward slash Sheen. And can they buy your book at that website? Right now, yes. Uh, so honestly, we are having a hard time keeping it in stock. So so the last I heard, there were just a few hundred copies left at St. Paul Center. Amazon is sold out. It might be back up on Amazon soon. We are working on another printing. Um, the book's doing so well that we're having a hard time keeping up. But stpaulcenter.com is, is the place to go. You can check Amazon, too. Well, I'm glad for your sake it's doing so well, but I think it indicates how needed it is in this time, right? When the demonic seems to be gaining gaining strength and not, not waning, unfortunately. So thank you so much, Father Definitely. Dave. Definitely. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And Dr. Gracie. Now, Father Roger Landry offers us, as is customary, a short and inspiring homily to prepare us for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a privilege for me to be with you as we enter into the finale of the consequential conversation the risen Lord Jesus has been having with us over the course of the last month with regard to what is the most important reality in the entire world, his own presence in the Holy Eucharist, and what our reaction is to that awesome reality. Insofar as the whole church in the United States has been having this conversation right after the close of the incredible National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis last month, and as we have been launching the missionary phase of the National Eucharistic Revival, what Jesus has been saying 
saying and our response to it are even more important than what he said and did three, six, nine, twelve, or more years ago when Jesus attempts to give us this triennial Eucharistic upgrade. So let's listen to the dramatic conclusion of his words as if we're hearing them for the first time and ask his help to respond like the saints would and have. Jesus, after having described that his flesh is real food and his blood real drink, after having encouraged us to work not for perishable food, but for this food that endures to eternal life, after having indicated that this divine gift is far greater and more important for our survival than the manna God used to rain down each day for the Israelites in the desert was to their survival, brings us this Sunday to the climax of his Bread of Life discourse. It's just as personal for us as it was for his first listeners. The climax is the choice he wants us to make, the commitment he wants us to give, in response to his great divine gift, which is not just to believe his words that he is the true manna, that his body is real food and his blood real drink, and that whoever gnaws on his flesh and drinks his blood is eternal life and will be raised on the last day, but to structure our life in accordance with that belief. He's asking us to live a truly Eucharistic life, drawing our life from him in this supreme gift. He's asking us to make him the source, summit, root, and center of our existence. He's imploring us to choose him who has chosen us, to commit to him who made the ultimate commitment to us, to be faithful to him as he is faithful to us in the new and eternal covenant sealed in his body and blood. But that's not easy, and it's certainly not a given. In the gospel, we read that many of the disciples who heard Jesus' words said, this teaching is difficult, who can accept it? These were not strangers to Jesus. These were people who had been amazed and astonished by his teaching over the previous two years, who had heard him preach like no one before. These were people who had witnessed him make blind men see, deaf men hear, cripples walk, lepers restored to the skin of babies, and possessed people liberated from their diabolic possession. These were people who the previous day had just seen Jesus feed a crowd of 5,000 men, 5,000 women, and probably 15,000 kids on five buns and two sardines. They were now saying that Jesus was a- what Jesus was asking was too hard for them to stomach. We have to admit that they were right about Jesus' teachings being hard. At first glance, they're disgusting. To eat someone's flesh and drink someone's blood smacks of cannibalism. Moreover, for a Jew, they couldn't even touch blood without becoming ritually impure. Now Jesus is saying that they needed to drink blood, something that seems straight out of a sick vampire novel. Even 2,000 years after the Last Supper, when Jesus would show how he would fulfill these words by totally changing bread and wine into his body, blood, soul, and divinity, the teaching is still hard. It's hard to believe that the creator of the whole world, the savior of the human race, the miraculous carpenter from Nazareth, is actually hidden under the appearances of simple human food in the altar. That the Eucharist is Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. That the Eucharist is not bread or wine at all but the second person of blessed trinity. Jesus' teaching is hard, but that shouldn't surprise us. Jesus never pretended that his teachings were easy. When he talked about forgiving 70 times, seven times, when he spoke about cutting off hands or plucking out eyes if they lead us to sin, when he discussed turning the other cheek, denying ourselves, picking up our cross and following him, when he described losing our lives in order to save them, when he conversed about loving him more than we love father and mother, brother, sister, child, work, or property, when he remarked about loving others just as he has loved us by sacrificing our life for them. All of this is hard. But with regard to the disciples' question, who can accept it? The answer has to be one with faith in Jesus. That's what we see in Peter's response when, after Jesus watched most of his disciples abandon him because they didn't want to accept his teaching, and then turned to the twelve apostles and asked poignantly, Do you also want to leave? Simon Peter stood forward and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The teaching wasn't any easier for Peter than for the thousands of disciples who had just abandoned Jesus. It would only become fathomable a year later during the next Passover, when Jesus would take bread and wine into his hands and totally change them into himself, as he said, This is my body, take and eat, and this is the chalice of my blood, take and drink. But Peter knew that Jesus had the words of eternal life. So because of his faith in Jesus, he put his faith in Jesus' words. Likewise, we need to have faith in Jesus' words. The great Eucharistic hymn, Adorate Devote, written by St. Thomas Aquinas, we sing, I believe whatever the Son of God has said, nothing is truer than the word of truth. We believe in Jesus' difficult teaching on the Eucharist because we believe in him, and believing in him means basing our entire existence on what he reveals. 
And so the choice comes to us this Sunday, a choice we can't duck because to try to duck the choice is to deny the Lord. Over the course of the last month, Jesus has been preparing us for this moment. He multiplied the loaves and fish, not only to show his compassion and power, but to foretell what he was planning to do with the multiplication of the Eucharist. He told us to labor for this food more than the hardest working parents strive to put food on their table. He told us that he was the true manna that the Father wants to give us to sustain us in the desert of human life. The answer to the prayer he put on our lips, give us today our super super substantial bread, and sir, give us this bread always. Jesus answers that prayer for us every day, but now we have to respond to his personal daily gift. Jesus wants us to draw our life from him, to live a Eucharistic life, to experience a spousal union with him, consummated in the one flesh loving communion that happens in the marriage bed of the altar, when we as the bride of Christ take within us the body of the bridegroom, become one flesh with him, and are capacitated to bear fruit, to make love with him in all our actions. Are we ready to make that commitment? It's easy to say yes, but do we really mean it? In response to Jesus' query, do you also want to leave me? Many in our age, like the disciples in Capernaum, have wandered physically or spiritually away from Jesus in the Eucharist. We can think of so many of our beloved Protestant brothers and sisters who, despite believing that sacred scripture is the authoritative word of God and who interpret sacred scripture literally, try to pretend, consciously or unconsciously, that Jesus is just speaking symbolically about needing to eat his flesh and drink his blood. We can think of so many of our Catholic brothers and sisters, five of six Catholics in the U.S., who have wandered away from the practice of Sunday Mass, serving some other God than the Lord on Sunday, whether it be work or sports or sleep or entertainment. We can think even of those who come to Mass but who do not receive the Lord Jesus with faith, love, and reverence, who basically behave as if they're only receiving consecrated bread rather than the very God who died for them on the cross and who seem to be impatient to leave Jesus' presence and go somewhere else as soon as possible. We can also think of those who show up with their hearts and lives divided, who instead of making a total choice for God, live in some situation incompatible with God, and who nevertheless come up to receive him without converting and going to receive Jesus' forgiveness in the sacrament of confession first. There's a point in reality which St. John pointed out that it was only at the conclusion of Jesus' talk in Capernaum that Jesus, quote, knew the one who would betray him, unquote. Jesus, Jesus first glimpsed Judas' betrayal by Judas' reaction to him in the Eucharist. And it's somehow tragically fitting that Judas betrayed Jesus by leaving the first Mass a year later, when Jesus gave us his body and blood for the first time in the fulfillment of this Sunday's Gospel. Sadly, some come to Mass to receive Jesus, only to leave and continue to betray Jesus in their moral decision. At the end of this five-week course, Jesus asks each of us, Do you also want to leave? He asks whether we want to live united with him in the Holy Eucharist or live in some other way. He queries whether we'll make him in the Eucharist the source and the summit of our life or whether we'll just try to keep him in the Eucharist part of our life and a small part at that, something we do out of duty perhaps for an hour or so on Sunday. The response Jesus is hoping for is for us to echo St. Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. Peter, James, John, Andrew, and the other apostles except Judas had truly left everything to live with Jesus. They spent every day with Jesus who taught them, nourished them, helped them to pray, and prepared them to take not just his gospel, but his very presence in the Holy Eucharist to the ends of the earth. Unlike them, we don't have to leave our fishing boats, tax tables, homes, and families in order to be with Jesus. He comes to our parish every day. The question for us is whether we really want to be with him or whether we want to leave him alone. And if we do want to be with him. That will change not only the way we look at Sunday Mass, but also the way we look at the awesome privilege of daily Mass and the way we approach Eucharistic adoration. If the Eucharist really is Jesus, and we believe this truth and love Jesus, then we will soon recognize that there's nothing more we want to do than to come to receive him as well as we can, as often as we can. If the Eucharist really is Jesus, and we believe this truth and love Jesus, then we will soon reprioritize everything so that we can come to spend more and more time with him and bring our family members and friends to experience this same treasure. That's what the Eucharistic revival is all about. And that's what Jesus has been trying to do himself in us over these last five weeks. God bless you. Thank you so much for another exceptional homily, Father Landry. To check out more from Father Roger Landry, make sure to read all of his writings at the National Catholic Register at ncregister.com. We hope to have you back next week. And until then, you go with our prayers. Mm -hmm.